Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi, my name is Patty Fortin, and I manage public programs for the California Historical Society. And I'm really honored to be um, a part of CHS and to be a partner for this program. So I thank Jill and Zatsky and all the panelists for uh, participating this evening and, uh, and allowing us the opportunity to be here. California Historical Society actually is one of the repositories for the ACLU. We hold the Northern California Civil Liberties documentation, and we continue to collect based on the, on that particular collection. So we're really happy to be here. We love this am amazing exhibition, and um, we have some of our own reproductions in it. So um, thank you again to everyone who's here tonight, and we're going to hand it over to Satsuki, who I've actually worked with, which has been wonderful. We did a program several years ago, and um, obviously Chuck um, and John, they've all done programs with us related to Rebel Lawyer. So I'm really excited to hand over the mics and have them all begin and start this program. So again, thank you, Jill, Satsuki, all the speakers. And uh, I think you're going to have a wonderful night. So I'm just going to hand the mic over to Satsuki. She's going to turn herself, turn her mic on. So thank you again. Thank you, Patty. Um, first thing I'm going to do is boss you around because I think it, it would be a better interactive process if we could just get you to congregate towards the middle a little bit more. So unless you have a people phobia and you need to sit on the edges, if you could just come closer in so that we have a more compact conversation, that would be great. Thank you for being here this evening. And uh, thank you to the Jonathan Logan Family Foundation for... Uh, supporting this exhibit and also um, supporting our the advisory committee's effort to bring, bring programs as part of the uh, exhibition experience. So um, first I'll introduce myself. I, I am Satsuki Ina. Um, I was uh, born in Tuvi Lake, the maximum security um, segregation center during World War II. Um, my uh, mother kept a diary while she was incarcerated, and she made an entry every single day. And um, one of the entries that she made um, was kind of pivotal in my life and in my brother's life. She said, she, my father had been separated from us and sent to Bismarck, North Dakota. He was charged with sedition for making a five-sentence speech about the injustice and the unconstitutionality of the... Um, Loyalty questionnaire. Uh, and so they wrote to each other from two separate prison camps. And after they passed away, I found 182 letters that they had exchanged. And I also found her diary and my father's haiku journal. Uh, and in one of the letters, uh, they have decided to renounce their American citizenship. Uh, but before they made that life-changing decision, um, my mother was writing about what her experience was. And she said that um, in reference to the children, she wrote, because they have a Japanese face, I don't want them to be American. Uh, she wrote this in 1943 in Tule Lake. Um, one of the central arguments that Wayne Mortimer Collins made uh, in his um, effort to get citizenship returned back to those who were renunciants was that renunciation was uh, under duress. Being incarcerated, having no idea how long you're going to be held, uh, what would be your future, um, that just the, the climate of being in captivity and then being asked whether you would be loyal uh, whether you would uh, cast your fate to the possibility of just leaving America and creating a new life somewhere else. This is during war. The war hadn't ended yet. My parents had no idea what the outcome was going to be. Um, so my parents would eventually become one of the uh, couples, families, that would uh, be... Um, one of Wayne Collins' clients, in, in an effort to withdraw their renunciation uh, based on the fact that it was uh, 
made under duress, and that they would be able to have their citizenship returned to them. So uh, after my parents passed away, I found a box, and inside of this metal box um, were, was a letter from the um, Department of Justice saying, uh, enclosed are your birth certificates that you were required to submit when you renounced your citizenship and gave up your rights to everything entitled uh, an American citizen. And um, that letter was dated 1957. And, you know, my brothers and I realized that for the years that we were growing up in San Francisco Post, where we had no idea that our parents weren't American citizens because they were born in San Francisco and in Seattle. Uh, so... Personally, you know, my family owes a huge debt uh, to Wayne Collins. And to many other people, uh, Wayne Collins uh, was the hero that we needed. We needed somebody who had uh, the moral authority and the, the, uh, the guts to stand up and speak out on our behalf. And uh, eventually, about 5,600 people were um, permitted to have their citizenship returned to them. So we have this wonderful opportunity this evening uh, to have a conversation with um, two people who are very familiar with Wayne Collins. Uh, Wayne Merrill Collins, he's he's an attorney in his own right, a personal injury attorney, uh, educator, scholar, a great person to drive across the Bay Bridge with because he has great stories. Uh, I learned that he likes rats, which I don't. Uh, rats are very gentle, bonding animals, and they're very intelligent. <laughs> I've had at least 30 of them over the course of 74 Put years. your microphone on. He's had 30 rats in, his, in the course of his lifetime. Anyway, <laughs> um, so when um, his father passed away, uh, uh, he took over uh, and led to the final vindication of Iva Taguri de Aquino's false charges of treason as Tokyo rose, and hopefully you'll have something to say about that later on. And um, we also have with us uh, Charles Wallenberg, who's the biographer, author of Rebel Lawyer, Wayne Collins and the Defense of Japanese American Rights, and his book will be available for sale up in the lobby. It's recently published by Heyday Press, He's former chair of social sciences and professor of history at Berkeley City College. So we're honored to have you both here today. We're going to start with uh, uh, Charles uh, with a PowerPoint and uh, a short presentation. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Wayne says I have to say something new. Wayne has heard this uh, (laughs) ten times, maybe. (laughs) I'll try to say something new, but I don't think I'm going to be able to. I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank the uh, staff here for, we had some technical problems. I hope we're not still having technical problems. So I think, though, they've all been resolved. Um, you know, at least one of the renunciants is here today. Mr. Kashawagi is one of the people who actually, um, oh, I think Wayne Collins got back his citizenship in 1957 or 58. Um, so we actually have one of the one of the victims of that process you were talking about here tonight. And Mr. Kashiwagi, can you just raise your hand so people can see you because they may want to talk to you afterwards? Te agete domo. And uh, Mr. Kashiwagi's story is told in is referenced uh, several times in in the book. This is Wayne Collins. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I, I'm going to try to keep this very short, or you know, 15 minutes maybe. Um, I, um, I decided to write this book two or three years ago um, when the um, mayor of Roanoke, Virginia, and a presidential candidate named Donald Trump both began referring to Executive Order 9066 as a positive historical precedent for their proposals to eliminate or limit Muslim immigration to the United States. And, of course, Executive Order 9066, as I'm sure you all know, was the order issued by President Roosevelt in February of 1942 
that had the result of removing and incarcerating all people of Japanese descent who lived on the West Coast. 120,000 people, the majority of them American citizens, the majority of them California residents, although the order also applied to Oregon, Washington, and a portion of Arizona. Of course, that happened 77 years ago. But the man who is president of the United States today is a man who said that he thought Executive Order 9066 was a positive historical precedent. Um, William Faulkner once said that the past isn't dead, the past isn't even past. Well, I think you could argue that even after 77 years, the issues raised by Executive Order 9066 are not dead. They're not even past. Um, at the time of the executive order, Wayne Collins was a San Francisco attorney in his early 40s. He had a modestly successful legal practice providing legal services for middle and working class people and small businesses. But his real interest, his real passion, was in civil rights and civil liberties. And he was one of a small group of people who, in 1934, had organized the Northern California branch of the American Civil Liberties Union. He was a member of the board of the Northern California branch. He argued cases for the Northern California branch, usually on a pro bono basis, uh, no fee basis. And he was a close associate of this man, uh, Ernest Bessig, who was the sort of legendary executive director of the Northern California branch for like 35 or 40 years, from, the, from 1935 into the 1970s. And it was through Bessig and through the Northern California branch that... Um, Wayne Collins became involved in these Japanese-American court cases, cases to try to protect the rights and liberties of Japanese-Americans during the 1940s. Um, I deal with a lot of these different legal actions, but the, the book primarily concentrates on three of the big cases, the most important cases that Collins was involved in, the Korematsu case, the Renunciant case, and the Tokyo Rose case. Um, and so let me just very briefly go through those cases to give you an idea of his role and the kind of legal history of this. Of this. Uh, the first of these cases was the Korematsu case. It involved this young man, Fred Korematsu, who was born and raised in the East Bay, a graduate of Oakland High School, a blue-collar guy, a professional welder, and one of the very few people, one of a handful of people who resisted who did not obey the executive order. He was arrested, he was jailed, and he allowed Collins and the Northern California branch to use his case to challenge the constitutionality of the executive order, to challenge President Roosevelt's right to issue that order. And Collins took that case all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, Collins, um, Collins spent much of his youth in a home for poor and neglected boys. He had to work his way through night school to get a legal education. And yet in the fall of 1944, he was was before the Supreme Court. Virtually all the other lawyers involved in the case were Ivy League graduates. If this were a movie, of course, Collins would have won the case. Collins would have won the case and and would have lived happily ever after. But it wasn't a movie. He lost the case. In December of, or November of 1944, the court ruled that the executive order was constitutional and therefore that Fred Korematsu's uh, conviction was constitutional. Um, 39 years later, in 1983, nine years after Collins' death, uh, Collins died in 1974 at the age of 74, um, Federal District Judge Marion Hall Patel here in San Francisco overturned the original conviction of Fred Korematsu in 1942 and used as the basis of that decision most of the arguments that Wayne Collins had introduced into the original case in the 1940s. And then, um, just a few months ago, in a very strange and inconsistent court decision, Chief Justice Roberts of the U.S. Supreme Court, in upholding Donald Trump's... um, immigrant restriction said that executive that said that the Korematsu case was no longer valid and no longer precedent. 
So in a sense, I think you could say that Wayne Collins won a posthumous victory, but it took years and decades for that to happen. Uh, the second case is the one that, that has already been referred to, the, the renunciant case, involving over 5,000 people imprisoned at the Tule Lake camp in northeastern California who renounced their American citizenship. Um, Tule Lake was originally one of the ten original camps, but in 1943 it was made into what they called a segregation center, and the government segregated there all people that it defined as, quote-unquote, troublemakers or disloyal people. And conditions at Tule Lake dramatically deteriorated after that, became even much worse than at the other camps. And certainly those conditions and some of the things you've talked about led to about five, over 5,000 people, almost a third of the population at the camp, including Mr. Kashiwaga, to renounce their American citizenship. In the summer of 1945, as the war was winding down, the government said, since you people have renounced your American citizenship, we are now classifying you as enemy aliens, and you will be deported to Japan. These were people, all of whom had been born in the United States. Most of them had never been to Japan. Many of them didn't know the Japanese language. And at least initially, Wayne Collins was the only lawyer who was willing to take that case. And the case ended up lasting for 23 years. It wasn't until 1968 that the final group of of renunciants finally had their case, their case um, settled. But over that 23-year period, Collins prevented anybody from being involuntarily deported, and in the end, more than 90% of the plaintiffs got back their full rights of American citizenship. Certainly, the renunciant case was the most successful of these legal actions that Collins took during that period. And then the third case is the so-called Tokyo Rose case, it involved this young woman, Iva Taguri de Aquino, born and raised in Southern California, a UCLA graduate. In 1941, she made her first trip to Japan to visit a sick relative, and she was caught there when the war began. And eventually, the Japanese government required her to make English language broadcasts aimed at American servicemen serving in the Pacific. Um, she was actually one of about a dozen young women making these broadcasts. And the GIs who heard them began calling them collectively Tokyo Rose. But of the dozen or so people who made the broadcast, she was the only one who insisted upon keeping her American citizenship. And ironically, that gesture of loyalty to the United States got her into real trouble because after the war, the government said that she had been an American citizen giving aid and comfort to the enemy. And so she was indicted on treason charges. And Wayne Collins defended her in a 13-week-long treason trial here in San Francisco, kind of 1940s version of a, of a media circus. The government was never able to provide any direct evidence that she ever said anything against the United States. She was basically a disc jockey introducing American popular music. But she was convicted. She, was sent, she served six years in federal prison. She paid a $10,000 fine. She, her... American citizenship was taken away from her. The government tried to deport her. Collins prevented her from being deported, but for the rest of his life, he tried to get that original conviction overturned, either by judicial means or by presidential pardon. And in 1977, President Gerald Ford pardoned Iva Tagore de Aquino. I believe she's the only person convicted of treason in the United States to ever get a full unconditional pardon, including full restoration of her rights of citizenship. Remember, I mentioned that uh, Wayne Collins had died in 1974. Her pardon came in 1977, and by the time of her pardon, she was represented by Wayne Merrill Collins, and he played a major role in that process of, of getting that pardon. Uh, over, I don't know, 25, more than 25 years, um, the Tagore family was represented by the Collins family at basically a uh, pro bono basis with, with virtually no um, no payments of, uh, of, of fees. Um, I've uh, received her um, pardon when she was about 60 years old. She lived another 30 years 
Mm. Died, I think, in 2006 or 2007 at uh, age 90. You know, just just a couple other comments. And, and one is, I, th- I think it's very hard for us to understand the odds that Wayne Collins faced in these cases. I mean, this was during or immediately after the war in most cases. Um, he was up against the President of the United States, the Governor of the United States. He was up against overwhelming popular opinion, overwhelming media opinion. Even the leadership, the national leaderships of both the American Civil Liberties Union and the Japanese American Citizens League, even they opposed Collins's cases, at least in the early years. Um, Collins was able to bring the Korematsu case all the way to the Supreme Court only because the Northern California branch of the American Civil Liberties Union broke with the National Civil Liberties Union and said they would support the case. And it created a division between the San Francisco and New York offices of the ACLU that lasted for more than a quarter of a century. For the rest of his life, Collins said that the only real civil, civil liberties union in the United States was the San Francisco North. office, the Northern California branch. Um, Collins was so enraged at the opposition by the leadership of the Japanese American Citizens League that he said that JACL stands for jackal. 20, 25 years later, in 1967, a new generation of JACL leaders tried to make amends by inviting Collins to a, um, to a banquet that was going to be held on his behalf. Collins not only refused the invitation, but he said, if the JACL really wants to represent Japanese Americans, it should immediately disband and disperse. This is 25 years later. Collins admitted that he said, you know, I never forgive and I never forget. And he never forgave and he never forget the leaderships of both the ACLU and the JACL. Um, Collins, you know, was not so much a, a savior of Japanese Americans as in some respects he was an enabler of Japanese Americans. Um, his cases allowed people to begin to organize campaigns for justice. This, this is the defense table at the Tokyo Rose trial, and there's Collins and a man named George Olthausen, one of two lawyers that he brought on to help in the case. But the man standing behind him is Tetsujiro or Tex Nakamura, who was important in the Tokyo Rose case, but was particularly important in the Renunciant case. Um, he served as a kind of unofficial um, legal uh, advisor for the renunciants. He didn't renounce them himself, but he was at Tule Lake and served as a kind of unofficial advisor. And he was the man who convinced Wayne Collins to take the renunciant case. He organized something called the Tule Lake Defense Committee, which raised money for the case. Over about a 13 or 14 year period, the Tule Lake Defense Committee raised somewhere between seven and eight hundred thousand dollars from the Japanese American community to support this case. That would be like seven or eight million dollars in today's money. Um, he eventually became a Southern California attorney, uh, an important Southern California attorney, and uh, he died, I think, just two years ago at age 99. But um, I think he's, he's an example of this idea of, of, using, of using these cases as a way of organizing within the community itself. Another imp- very important figure is Chio Wada, this, the upper picture is uh, the marriage of Chio and Yori Wada in 1944. They were both Cal graduates. Yori became a very uh, well-known public official here in San Francisco, and in 1980 became the first Asian American appointed as regent of the UC system. Chio was the daughter of a man named Senri Nao, who was a Japanese immigrant and a art dealer here in San Francisco, and a long time family friend of Wayne Collins. And he hired Chio right after the war as his uh, office secretary. And she became the major victim of just an avalanche of um, paperwork created by the Renunciant case. I mean, thousands and thousands of pages of government documents and correspondence that, that the office had to turn out. And in order to accomplish that, she helped organize a group of Japanese-American volunteers who, for years and years, came into the office, often after regular office hours, to 
handle this huge amount of paperwork. I think I mentioned earlier that the renunciant case was Collins's most was greatest success, but he couldn't have won that success without the work of people like Tex Nakamura or Chiwata. Um, and of course, by the 1980s, those initial organizing uh, attempts had resulted in the redress movement, a powerful movement that gained power and, and, and um, interest or power and influence in American life. And the great accomplishment of that redress movement was the 1988 passage by Congress, signing by President Ronald Reagan, of the American Civil Liberties Act, which apologized for the executive order, provided a $20,000 um, reparations payment for all living survivors of the removal and incarceration process, and finally included what it called a statement of fact. And the statement said, in effect, that the executive order was unnecessary, unconstitutional, and was motivated primarily by racism and political expediency. And you know, um, if you take that statement and take away all the legalisms, that was essentially the argument that Wayne Collins made in his first brief in the Coral Matsu case back in 1942. And now, in 1988, 46 years later, 14 years after Collins' death, in effect, the government of the United States is saying, you know, Wayne, you were right all the time. <laughs> um, during the 1940s, during a time of war, Collins challenged the executive authority as commander-in-chief of one of the most powerful, popular, beloved presidents in American history. And in the end, in the long run, it was Collins' interpretation of the Constitution that was the correct interpretation, not the interpretation of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And that is the real legacy of Wayne Collins. That's the lesson that he's passed down to us in our generation. And that is the real historical precedent established by the story of Executive Order 9066. So today, with Donald Trump in the White House, the question is, where is Wayne Collins when we really, really, really meet him again? Thank you. Do you want to say, want to say a few words, or do you want me to just ask you questions? Yeah. You know. Push your button on. Better? Thanks. People's careers often take place by serendipity. And people's People's connections in life overlap many other connections and groups. My father's practice was relatively, somebody would call it marginal, not particularly financially remunerative in the late 30s, but he had achieved what all lawyers want to do secretly, never admit, but even Charlie Gary once admitted it late in life, he finally got to represent a mafia. And how that happened was that in the early 30s, my father bought a winery, along with Nam Hall, who was the first Western-style druggist in Chinatown. And they began to produce what they called sparkling burgundy, which is like the poor man's champagne, and to make a good deal of money until they began to quarrel over it. Now, down the road from their winery up near somewhere up there near Mendocino County, was an Italian farm. And one day they told Nam Hall they needed to get an attorney. They said, well, call Wayne Collins. And so he became the attorney for the De Martini family and the group of people who were all charged with being 
black marketeers during World War II, and he won the case. So he wasn't completely unsuccessful. He had that the apex <laughs> would actually defend black marketeers for being sued by Chester Bowles, the Office of Price Administration, for overcharging, smuggling whiskey. You got it. It was a lot of fun. But other things came up that were more important. It was the beginning of the war. My father was no friend of Republican extremists, but I think that he would agree with Barry Goldwater when he said that extremism in defense of liberty is no vice, and moderation in pursuit of justice is no virtue. And it is not by accident that the ACLU of Northern California, on its newspaper they published for many years on a monthly basis, had a slogan. And the slogan showed some 1776 soldiers, the drum, the fife, the musket, and it said, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. Eternal vigilance. It may seem crude to insist upon strict interpretation of the Constitution, that it means what it says, that it means what it says when Congress shall pass no law abridging freedom of speech. It doesn't mean balancing speech against some other interest. It says you shall not abridge freedom of speech. My father was born in 1899. His father himself was a, we call a telegraphic reporter, the Associated Press died of tuberculosis, 1907, common disease at that time. <clears throat> and my grandmother raised her father, my, 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 her father, my father, and two brothers. She was a frugal woman. She had four children in total. The first one was named Wayne Collins. He died, so she recycled the name. It was a practical family. Now, there came a point in time when after my grandfather's death, she could not take care of her family. And it was not unusual at that time in California and other parts of the country, when you couldn't take care of your children, you gave them up to some philanthropic agency. And so she surrendered two of her sons to an institution called The Rock, which was a boarding house on Potrero Hill, run by something called the Society for Helping Boys, one of those 19th century philanthropic organizations that pop up periodically in the American frontier. And they found these children, and they would put them through school. And they lived in this place called The Rock. And across the street was the Ginn House, run by the Ginn Publishing Company, the major textbook publishers in America, and it was the same operation. The Society for Helping Boys was run by Bruce Porter, who, was married, who later would marry William James's daughter, by a man named William Tevis, who happened to be the chief engineer of the Homestead Mining Company, so they had money. By Jules Kahn, now in disgrace, but it was a congressman for whom Jules Kahn Playground was named. And by Joseph Wister, Swedenborgian minister in San Francisco, that was the board. And he became intimately involved with that church, with Joseph Wister and with Bruce Porter, and thus with Bruce Porter's wife, William James's daughter. And he met a very interesting group of people who really reared him and brought him some culture. He was not quite the kind of uh, wandering Irish urchin that some books or people portray him. He was a rather cultured fellow, although self-educated. He had some trouble with the law, and he had some trouble with authority. And he managed to be expelled from three grammar schools by the time he was 12. Those things happened to some boys. He felt he was improperly accused of something or not having done something, and he resisted. He rebelled. He barricaded himself in the men's room. He wouldn't leave. Nobody could come in. He armed himself with a club. Some kids behave that way. But they behave that way when they see an injustice being done to them, and they won't tolerate it. He was raised in an era when people still read the Constitution, when they still read Rousseau, when they still read Montesquieu, and he did when he decided to become a lawyer because he always educated himself thoroughly in the foundations of what law was. So 
those are his fundamental principles. And when legal theorists said in the 1700s that man has certain natural rights, natural rights, that may be a fiction, he believed it, and he agreed with it, and he conducted his life in that fashion ever after, that people have certain inalienable, inalienable rights, rights they can't give away, can't lose, and which cannot be alienated, taken from them. Not just life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but your own freedom, your own individuality, your right to have friends and associates of your own choosing. Yes, even your right to bear arms. Peter Irons mocks my father in his pleadings in the Korematsu case because he talks about uh, depriving someone of the right to bear arms. That's just one of the ten rights he enumerates. It's the Bill of Rights. When Japanese Americans were taken to internment camps, they lost every right which the Constitution guaranteed them, their right to freedom of speech, their right to petition for redress of grievances, which means, by the way, to send a letter to your congressman and to have him or her introduce a petition in the House of Representatives for redress of grievances. And for decades, the first Monday of the month, congressmen read the petitions that they received from their constituents Often they put them on the table. They're often from Vermont and New Hampshire demanding the abolition of slavery. Those are put on the table every year. And John Quincy Adams was the one congressman that fought to have them removed from the table and addressed in Congress. Your right to petition for redress of grievances because the government is supposed to be responsible to you and not you to it. Your right to have freedom of religion, whether you be Buddhist and to practice that in your own fashion, nothing more precious. Your right to assembly. When you're in an assembly center, you can't assemble. You've been assembled by someone else. And you can't decide to run for public office because you're stuck in a concentration camp. And you can't communicate with your own congressman. And you can't read the papers that you want to read. And you can't say what you want to say. You're stripped of every fundamental right. When a criminal in California is arrested, they're taken before a magistrate, a magistrate, a judge, and they are advised that they have a right to an attorney, a right to know the charges against them, a right to cross-examination of the witnesses opposed to them, a right to be found guilty by a jury of 12 people by a unanimous verdict, the right to take the power of the court to subpoena a witness and compel him to come and testify for the defense. Those are the first rights given to a person accused of a criminal act in California. But in February 2000, 2000, 1942, no Japanese American was read that Bill of Rights when they were taken from their homes and interned in concentration camps. Every single right that is inherent to an American citizen and they've been believed in by believers in natural law from the European, Western European tradition for years, was taken away from them, every single one. That's the intellectual side. Imagine the emotional side of being stuck behind barbed wire, of being denied your freedom of movement, your freedom of communication. Those were rights that were denied. But all the worst was yet to follow. To my father, they were kindred spirits because they were insisting upon their rights in the face of injustice. They were the heroes in World War II in this country. And yes, even the Hoshi Don, deplorable though some of their conduct may have been, they too were heroes because they too were victims of the denial of their civil rights and internment under duress. All their renunciations of citizenship were void ab initio from the beginning because of the duress that had been imposed upon them. Unfortunately, the liberal mind sees things differently. The liberal mind of the democratic mind of America at that time, the governmental bureaucracy, the cabinet, the administration, and the government, and they make concessions to necessary interests. For example, in wartime, the war power, the need to exclude American citizens from the coast. 
There was no need to exclude them. How do we know this? And not because Peter Irons discovered it, but because Earl Warren, in 1942, testified before a United States Congressional Committee called the Tolan Committee, which was investigating migration and the war or immigration in California. Tolan was a liberal Democrat. He wanted to soften the effects of a possible internment, but by the time his commission got to California, 9066 had been promulgated. And Earl Warren appeared before that committee to testify that, yes, there have been no acts of sabotage. All the more proof that their sabotage intent is well organized and will manifest itself. And he was the governor of California. Yeah. That was the Tolan Committee. So that reflects the attitude that Californians had as the war began. And public opinion as well. But you have to stand up against public opinion, even among your fellow lawyers. The ACLU, nationally, did not oppose the evacuation orders. They deplored them, but they wouldn't take a test case against them. Why is that? Because they were so tied into or connected with what they thought was the liberal politics. <laughs> That's Ernie Bessig interrupting me on your screen. <laughs> <laughs> no, the sound went off. I knew I could take care of Ernie. <laughs> I want to be very brief. Let me jump ahead to Tule Lake. In Tule Lake, riots had occurred for a whole source of reasons, but primarily, Tully Lake was like, what did my father call it? It was like an insane asylum by 1944, 45. And there was a riot when they thought that they found that the administration was siphoning off food that was being grown to the lake and sending it to other camps. When there were some strikes at Tully Lake, and some violence ensued, and the army occupied Tully Lake. In fact, Justice Hugo Black, in the court of opinion, pointed to Japanese being disloyal because of a look at the riot at Tule Lake. That stuff in the, in the court of opinion. What had happened? The administration arrested and placed several dozen people, maybe over 100, into a stockade in Tule Lake. Now, they were denied all their rights in that stockade, and they got some letters out looking to find someone who could represent them. And they wrote to the JACL, which wouldn't do a thing. And they wrote to the National ACLU, which didn't do a thing. And they wrote to the American Friends Service Committee and couldn't get through. And one letter got through to the ACLU of Northern California. And Ernest Bessig went up to Tule Lake to investigate these claims that there was a stockade. And there was. And the administration promised to close the stockade, and it didn't happen. So my father went up to Tule Lake and met with some of the people in the stockade. Talked to the administration, they promised they were going to tear it down. They didn't. He filed a habeas corpus action in the federal court in San Francisco. But in two days, the stockade was down. But it took that kind of action to do it. In the meantime, New York ACLU had sought to intervene with these activities. They had ordered Bessig not to appear in Tule Lake. They ordered him not to do anything further about these cases. And Bessig said, well, I can't stop it. The Wayne Collins is a lawyer, and he's their lawyer. And the ACLU is not anybody's lawyer. And it wasn't. They didn't have their own lawyers at that time. So you can find some of the experts on, uh, uh, in, in some of the recent books on internment, overheard conversations uh, in Washington, how angry uh, they were that this guy Collins was out of control. The Department of Justice felt that out of control because it's not the way we want to approach this thing. Then came the renunciation cases. While he was up in Tule Lake, 
at the stockade to talk to some of his clients. He was approached by, oddly enough, an employee from the camp administration who said, some people need to talk to you, and they're waiting at the administration office, and those were renunciants. And they told him what had happened, and he couldn't believe you could renounce your citizenship in time of war, even though Francis Biddle, the Attorney General, had introduced the law, which signed, was signed by FDR, that you could renounce your citizenship voluntarily anytime you wanted to during that war. And they were encouraging them to do it. In fact, encouraging that to happen in Tule Lake. At once he wrote some letters for them to sign saying that they revoked any renunciation, that it was void. But then more and more came forward and asked to they take the cash. He couldn't do it. I can take a few, but my God, I can't take 5,000, 6,000 people. But he couldn't find another lawyer to do it. Tetsujiro Nakamura was the legal affairs officer at Tule Lake to assist internees with legal problems. Tex had traveled the state looking for lawyers for the internees. He couldn't find one. And then he met my father, and they had a long conversation. And my father said, all these renunciations are void for a host of reasons, void at the inception for the mere fact you've been interned, period. That's adequate to rest to render void any action you've taken to renounce your nationality. Well, government's position was that you had to have actual physical duress to make that void. You had to be terrified by the Hoshidan. Some people were. Some people weren't. It didn't matter. Even the Hoshidan was entitled to relief and their citizenship back because they're all victims of the same system. It all goes back to saying you won't tolerate injustice anywhere against yourself or your freedoms or anyone else's. It goes back to natural law. And that's why he could take those cases. That's why to him, the renunciants were heroes. Heroes of the internment program. And that included the Hoshidan. So I guess I should, I should sit down right now because I'm, I'm going to be <laughs> <laughs> getting the book. says, go this way. And I'm off stage. of Wayne Collins um, in a document that I found at the National Archives and it's a, uh, a letter uh, addressed to the Attorney General Tom Clark uh, with the Department of Justice on November 14, 1945 written by Wayne Collins so that you can get a feel. Um, Tex Nakamura, his aide, uh, his assistant, uh, was asked uh, in the book well, what was Wayne Collins like? And um, Tex said, well, he was Irish. He had a hot temper. Uh, and um, the lore and, uh, about Wayne Collins was that he was a fiery, uh, very intense, um, determined uh, man who, um, um, you know, crossed roads that people weren't happy about. So in this letter, you get a little feel. He says, these renunciants whom I represent are long-suffering citizens. They have submitted to grosser indignities and suffered greater losses of rights and liberties than any other group of persons during the entire history of the nation, all without good cause or reason. They have been misunderstood, slandered, abused, and long have been held up to public ridicule, abuse, and contempt. The mistreatment was initiated by an unjustified evacuation from the West Coast, it was intensified by imprisonment in a concentration camp for over three years. With all the attendant suffering and misery this entailed, now these attorneys faced with loss of citizenship rights are confronted with a threatened involuntary deportation to Japan, a country and nation to which they owe no allegiance, which has no claim upon them, and with which they are not familiar. It is time that this whole pernicious program of oppression was terminated. It is time the exercise of arbitrary and capricious power over them should cease. The damage done them cannot be repaired that further injury can be stopped. You have the right and the power to call halt to this program. You can prevent further mischief being done and thereby eliminate, alleviate the misery these unfortunate people endure. At the time, 
time, it was Wayne Collins' only voice that was so clear about the injustice that was being committed. And um, today, you know, we're facing a very similar kind of uh, injustice, targeting vulnerable people, particularly um, repetition of our history at the border where people who are seeking asylum are suffering many of the same experiences <coughs> that we did back then. Family separation, mass incarceration, charges of being criminals and uh, threat to national security with no proof or evidence of that. Uh, threat to our economic well-being, uh, unassimilable race of people. This is the language that we heard that was described about us, that, that made it possible for Americans to turn their backs on us while the classrooms were emptied out of the Japanese kids, where the houses were empty, <coughs> where the farms were left abandoned. There was no organized petition, chants, rallies, protests that were going on in our behalf. And um, so I think of Wayne Collins as a as a hero, but also as a model for protest. So I'm interested in asking two of you questions about uh, what what do you understand um, made up? Uh, what what are the qualities or the events or characteristics that we can learn from about protest and being a rebel or being a rebel citizen? Um, from your knowledge as a son and also as an attorney. Also, um, Chuck, as a biographer. Boy, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, you have. Um, I don't think you can necessarily be a pleasant, always a pleasant person. You can't always be the kind of person who goes along. He was. He had a streak of, um, of anger, of, of resentment fighting, and that's part of it. Um, he also, um, and this is, you know, Wayne talked about uh, Peter, Peter Irons, a legal scholar who agreed in theory with Wayne Collins but attacked his, his legal. Um, Collins was a lawyer, but he also was a moralist, and the moral issues were more important to him than the legal issues. Um, the moral foundation of the Constitution was more important than specific. So um, his his briefs would always cover the law, but they'd go into these kinds of moral issues. He, you know that 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 letter um, kind of summarized a big long brief that he had sent too. But he t turns that letter not into a legal brief but into a moral argument and. Um, you know, Wayne talked about the Hoshidan. Those were the people at um, at Tuli Lake. There were maybe somewhere between a thousand and two thousand people who were pro Japan, and they were very active and sometimes very violent. But he even said, "I will represent these people too because they are American citizens. They also suffered these these terrible things." So I think very few of us um, would be willing to go as far as he, he was willing to go. Um, but people like that are absolutely necessary. You can't just go along. I, another, and, well, and I, I touch it with Well, I'll push it on. Tex was in Japan in the 50s and he went to see the man. Uh, he said, the guy that ran the Hoshidan said, well, God damn, why don't you join the class house? You got your citizenship back too. Because they really wanted to. Absolutely serious about it. But at that time he was an old geezer. I don't know, I don't know. I was told my story in the Russian you can go to hell. Anyway, that, that's the kind of, kind of attitude. So that's how I would say that from tax for you. But my father was mustered out of the Navy in World War I. Uh, in 
conducted to the Army and expelled apparently to play a bad heart. So he turned the Navy the next day. Got a letter saying he made a mistake. It was the wrong guy. Returns are too late on the U.S. Navy. And he shipped out of a hospital ship in 1918. And they made several trips across the Atlantic to bring wounded soldiers down. Uh, when he came back, and your muster out, they said, well, here's your shit. Go take a train back where you came from. Three cents a mile. So they sent these recruits back. But first, he uh, rented a horse, and he rode through West Virginia. And even for someone who had come from a very poor family, he was stunned by what he saw. He was wearing his naval uniform, which he was Navy whites, no brain. But they thought he was an admiral. <laughs> he didn't disabuse them. You got to take some liberties. But the poverty, People with no teeth, people with no food, people with no housing, stunned him. Even him, I don't think he ever forgot it. Yes, he was a socialist. He was a yes, he was a friend of Norman Thomas. Yes, he was the attorney for the Socialist Party in California in the 30s. Represented them. So you had to fight for liberty every day in the 20s and 30s. And you couldn't back down and make it. You couldn't. They arrested people for picketing on the sidewalk, for blocking the sidewalk. They would have arrested them if they had picketed in the street, but they'd been blocking traffic. They had an ordinance in San Francisco. Those were a bunch of atrocities in 1938, I found this stuff in the attic. These things were endless. Arresting anarchists for being talking to people on street corners, uh, suppressing the publication of newspapers. This was constant throughout the 30s beating up and attacking organizers of farm labor in the valley up north, where he took the case of space LU, and now we're in Jin and South. But they were beating up and tar and feathering farm labor organizers. All this stuff went on in the 30s. Uh, and it's very different change during the war, so we changed focus during the war. So that's nothing new. That's a struggle that never ends. So with the uh such a determined, moral, strong father. What was it like growing up with him? Well, I'm a wreck. <laughs> <laughs> Look, like, like a lot of parents, you can reach 45 years older than I am. It's old enough to be my grandfather. They had a code. They grew up doing it before World War I. They were self supporting They made their own way. They were self-educated, basically. Like all those U.S. senators were, Republican Party, and very, very in senators. You know, the, the Northerners who supported FDR and the, the New Deal, uh, who were, never had college educations, wandered across the country with the DAs in various states, with the governors, with all that other. That's the kind of people you had from that era, and they believed in self determination for yourself, mm -hmm. independence and your debts and be beholden to no one. But they were beholden to no one, especially not the government. They didn't believe in a big government. That was a position. It was a very American position. You might it in a bad way and you might it in a good way. But that was the moral ethos. You expect your son to behave accordingly. And did you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Do you check, um, you know, there's a rising uh, Japanese American activism that's happening. And uh, we're wearing our t shirts tonight, and we brought the tsudu from uh, our protest in Texas uh, at the border and in front of the Tex South Texas detention facility. And um, it's taken a long time for our community to. We have certainly advocated for ourselves, for redress, and there has been activism. But there's a um, the shift is happening now that we're feeling more and more like we have the moral authority and the responsibility to speak up on behalf of others in the way that Wayne Collins modeled. Um, but um, we've also been, we're either descendants or actual uh, victims of having been incarcerated and 
surveilled by the government. There's always this feeling that if we step across the line, if we oppose the government, something terrible is going to happen. My mother used to say that to me all the time. If you do something bad, bad things will happen to you here. So we've lived under that kind of uh, cloud of um, needing to be good 110% Japanese American citizens. Um, so, you know, we're talking about um, Wayne Collins as a moral man, a man who was very committed to that. And he seemed unrestrained in that way. And in, in some ways, that's kind of a privilege of not having been directly oppressed, um, although he certainly had poverty in his life. Can you comment about that? Well, I mean, I, I, I think in some respects, the title of this the then they came they came from me it makes that point that um, when you stand up for these things, even if you're not being directly affected this time, next time they could come for you. And I think Collins, he had a lot of and a lot of bad things happen to him in his life. I think that whole experience of his family falling apart and having to live in this in this institution. That had that had to have an impact on, on the rest of his life, um, and I think also that you know that the role and Wayne I can, can correct me if I'm wrong on this or, or elaborate on, it, but the fact that that institution was tied to the Swedenborgian Church, Sweet Swedenborgian Church, you know, which still exists. Uh, just, uh, there, there's a. There's a philosophy that, that Christianity involves um, living that way in your own life. And I think people like Bruce Porter and, and others influenced him a lot in his, in his youth and continued to support him you know, at a time when almost no other white people in San Francisco were supporting him in these court cases without like Bruce Porter was. And I think also, um, and this is getting a little off the point, but I think it was Bruce Porter who introduced him to this um, Japanese immigrant, Mark Ewer, somebody now. And um, maybe Porter and now were older men, maybe they were kind of either figures, but they, they gave him a sense and a, a, an experience that was unlike most white people in San Francisco. Uh, and it gave him not only that sympathy for, for the underdog, but it also gave him an appreciation of, of the of Asian American and Japanese American life. Very, very, very few words. I don't know whether I'm kind of straying away from here or from the point, but I think it's that kind of, those kinds of experiences and that kind of, um, kind of commitment that Wayne talked about to those kinds of basic principles that you have to hang on to. That's why it's, it's so easy. I mean, what, what can often happen to a group of people who are who face the kind of terrible things that Japanese Americans face, they can sometimes become bitter and want to lash out at somebody else because of that. I think one of the good things that's come out of this in, at, at this time has been that Japanese American activism on behalf of Muslim Americans, on behalf of Obviously, it's the right way to respond rather than this uh, what somebody else did. And he, he believed that. disloyal, 
uh, to someone who was actually really patriotic in the American sense, sense of dissent. Um, we've made progress in really telling the truth about the Nona Boys at Tui Lake over the years, but there's still uh, some within our own community who don't believe it, and they always point to that picture of the Hoshidan, of the pro-Japan faction, saying, well, wait a minute, you have these radical pro-Japan disloyals, what are you saying? They're, you know, they weren't all, you know, so-called patriots. And so, what do you say to those people um, in order to convince them? Well, I mean, you know, again, um, for example, the leadership of the JACL wouldn't even support um, Fred Karmatsu, but um, <laughs> um, so in Tui Lake and, and there are people here who probably know more about it, there was there was a tremendous variety of different kinds of opinions. And and for those who who when he talks about the no no boys, there was a federal questionnaire that was sent out and there were questions about would you would you fight for the United States? Do you do you dis disavow any loyalty to the Japanese Emperor? And people who who answered no to both of those questions were automatically assumed to be disloyal or troublemakers and all that. And some of them probably were Bush. Some of them they, you know there were a couple thousand people at thousand, maybe or two thousand people at two like who were pro Japan. But there were thousands of others who wrote no, no, because they were standing up for basic, you know, American rights. So it, it's so difficult to make generalizations about all these people. But in a sense, Wayne Collins's answer would be: all of these people deserve to have their constitutional rights, even if they're pro-Japan. If they're pro-Japan and they can and they violate the law, if they're pro-Japan and they and they engage in in um, spying, then you know, charge them for spying. Or if they blow up a plant, charge them with a plant. But they have constitutional right to root for Japan. And so, you know, again, and, and so I mean, he was, again, I, I think it's very important that how far he was willing to go for these principles. And, you know, the Constitution, or the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, is, we've been arguing about this recently, says that anybody born in the United States is an, is an American citizen. So, Collins' original position on the, on the renunciation was they don't have the right, they, he, he said, a person doesn't even have the right to renounce his American citizenship because you're born, you know, the Constitution says you've got it, you've got it. So, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question correctly, but I, I guess I'm putting myself in, in our Collins, and he would say that even even people who are pro Japan, they have constitutional rights. Those rights have to be have to be protected. And if that's the case, then certainly everybody else, even somebody who said I'm not, even somebody who who, who refused to be drafted, for example, or some because of violations. Of, you know what I mean? And, and, and I don't know whether that answers your question. But I think it does give, a, give you a sense of the, um, how far Collins was willing to go. And I think probably Wayne and I would agree that he was right on that. He, he was willing to take Coach Udon people and say, if you want me to represent you, I will fight to keep you from being deported. I will fight to get your citizenship back. And well, look at some of the things written by the Harkin Mountain Resistance. They're speaking in the language of the Constitution, with which they seem to be intimately familiar. They're speaking in the words of Tom Paine. They're speaking in the words of the Declaration of Independence. They read those things. They had education, education in American schools, and they believed that stuff. Because it was important. Because they had a new language, and it was theirs. They had a new country, and it could be theirs. Yes, they were coming free of their parents, and that was theirs. And they were told about certain principles, and those principles were goddamn strong and appealable to youth. The right to freedom of speech, the right to freedom of assembly, 
everything they've been promised by the foundation of this country, and they spoke in that language, and they believed in that. Now, if the Oshidan were violent in some words, if they killed a guy, and they did. If they terrorized people, and they did. They didn't do that before they were put in an internment camp. So, let's not put the cart before the horse. Their reality was an unreal and artificial situation. It's reprehensible to be supporting Japan. Right. The last Democratic government was over in 1933, 34, Tanakh. Bad stuff. But when you only are sitting in a camp with no friends and no support, the enemy of your enemy becomes your friend. Suppose some people pay probably wanted Japan to win. Do you blame them? It has nothing to do with their renunciation being valid. Some people joined the Hoshidan. Some of them acted like thugs. Fine. What do you expect? This is an artificial environment. These acts are acts not taken by people in a state of freedom. Okay? Those acts are void and they are the responsibility of the United States government. Government. More than the people of California, but government which have the obligation to defend them and to prevent this from happening. Even George Bush, after 9-1-1, did a better job than FDR. pertains to um, the activism that is happening now that's coming from the Japanese American community. I come from a diaspora community as well, Cuban Americans, and coming from my um, generation, which is like first born and second born uh, generation Cuban people, so like essentially the Nisei and the um, such other of, of what we have, I find it difficult for people in my generation to look at political issues that their family experienced and actually take part in some sort of activism that's happening in the modern lens. So how is it for you uh, to engage with uh, younger generations of the Japanese American community and sort of try to create a momentum for this activism that y'all are doing now? Um, I don't see it as us elders trying to rally the young people. I feel like the young people with their Instagrams and their social media skills and whatever have uplifted uh, our, uh, and expanded and deepened our efforts uh, to be activated. Um, but I, I think it has taken, you know, many of us are in our 70s and 80s now and we were children in the camps. And, um, I think it's taken our lifetime to get to a point where we feel like we have a right to speak out. And uh, so the resonance that we heard kind of pushed us into that next stage. Uh, and activism to me feels like uh, a process of healing. It's using our voices when we couldn't use our voices back then, when my parents were uh, unable to speak out. Um, and now to, to be able to go and protest and feel completely righteous about it is a uh, culmination of years of uh, trying to understand what happened. So much of our experience in camp and our parents' experience was suppressed. Uh, so we didn't know all the details. We didn't know how outrageously uh, you know, violated they were. So um, kind of a synchronicity that this, this uh, experience that's happening today with the presidency and the, the whole political uh, spectrum of targeting people for religion, uh, for color, for uh, origin. Um, I think it ignited this uh, feeling for us that as we are getting older, this is this is the opportunity. This is the time. So our protest has uh, included many, many young people. Uh, and um, you know, we 
we were in Texas and we were chanting and everything, and one of the millennials comes over to me and says, Dr. Ina, you're supposed to fist bump with your left hand, not your right hand. <laughs> 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 I said, oh, okay. <laughs> My friend Paul Takagi, uh, one of the first Nikkei um, professors at UC Berkeley, um, taught criminology. And before he died, uh, he told me that he had spoken to your father. And uh, he's, I can't remember the exact words, but I remember he said that there was some, uh, maybe some, uh, some resentment he said he detected from your dad because after all he did, you know, for for us, um, I, I came to know your father rather recently. And to me, your dad is the Martin Luther King to the Nikkei, you know, for what, what he did. And uh, I just wondered if um, if Paul was correct in that there was some resentment or maybe some, maybe did your dad ever feel forgotten after all he did for us, that there wasn't more um, acknowledgement or more, because uh, I never, you know, I never, your dad never came to any of the, uh, you know, the, the Japanese um, American uh, social uh, gatherings, et cetera. So I just wondered, did he ever feel forgotten for all he did? You mean he himself feel forgotten? He was forgotten. There's an old man. We're all forgotten when we're old. No, I'm sorry. You know, we're out of circulation. We're not part of the current generation that's grown and changed. I find it hard to relate to people under 74. <laughs> <laughs> Last week was just under 73. This week is now that I'm under 74. I don't talk the same way, but I haven't experienced life the same way they have. So I have interpreted reality the person differently than they have. I look at the political turmoil today and I think it lacks direction. It's okay to resist for your own, that's natural. It's natural to resist your own oppression. What's important is to resist the oppression of others, uh, to demonstrate for others than just your own. That's what makes me used to call brotherhood. Call it solidarity now. People under <laughs> okay. solidarity. That's what humanity, was being human, is all about. Recognition as the as the other, as yourself, and yet to be. Democracy is the ability to cooperate with difference. That's all it is. Okay. The only way you can preserve independence, individuality, is through democracy and recognition that you're part of a social. Now I'm digressing, I should shut up, so but say something. I, just, I do, th I mean, I, 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 Wayne maybe knows it better than, than I, but I, I do think he did feel, I, I do, my impression was, towards the end of his life, he felt like he was against he was me, like, not against Paul. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's true, some of us against his own son. But, but I mean, no, I mean, there, there, there was that sense that he wasn't, you know, in 19, 57 or 58 or something like that, the Eisenhower administration kind of finally announced that we're going to give back most of the renunciants their, their citizenship. And there was a big ceremony and all these people came and the one person who wasn't invited was going to come. And so I think there was that sense. And, um, and it was, in a funny way, it's continued to write the present day. It's, it's, I mean, some of the writings about Wayne Collins, not present day, but in the last 30 years or so, people like Peter Irons, they still put him down. And um, I think he felt it then, and I think he would, if he were alive, he would still feel it today. I think he would, my guess is he would, he, he might be grumpy at a session like this, but I think he would, he would probably enjoy it too. He wouldn't show up for him. Yeah, that's pretty much it. He would have been having to join something. Did his family, uh, uh, well, his family ever, uh, did, did he ever reunite with his brothers? What happened? 
Did he ever reunite with his brother? His brother. You yeah. said that your father was separated. Yeah. Can I tell you the whole story? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Just okay. part of it. Still part of it. With his brother. You said there are. Oh, four. the one, the one that. He, oh, with the, the, the winery in 1934. Yeah. Well, in 1954, it was for a Notre Dame hospital. Uh, with my father, we just gone to see his mother, who was dying of uremia, and. Uh, his car pulled up next to ours, and this guy got out, and he sort of looked like the old man, except he was wearing a straw hat. You know, these semi-human types from L.A. wore straw hats. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, Low man! I was like, Low man! He got in his car and left. Well, yes, yeah, so they did encounter it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, Wayne did send money to his brother for years, uh, and kept him and his family going. And after his brother died, he sent money to his brother's widow. Mm -hmm. But there was there doesn't seem to be any kind of personal relationship. I really want to thank you, Chuck, for writing this book. Um, I'm a long-standing friend of Wayne's, and I've always noticed in the public record, even since the early 70s, that there were lots of successes in the fight for reparations and a correcting of the record especially by Japanese American citizens, et cetera. I never saw Wayne Collins' name. And I'm very touched and pleased, and I think he would be quietly proud that this book is published and it has spawned and is creating all this enthusiasm, and especially for the possibility of, of redress, if you will, on behalf of others, as Wayne has said. I'm very touched that you're going to the border and offering your support to the migrants who are being so brutally treated today, and that they are from a different ethnic group, not an issue. It's another human being who's suffering in much the same way. You have enormous moral authority to do that. And I think your age, too, and your connection to your parents enhances your leadership capacity. So I want to just make one other comment. When Donald Trump suggested that all the sanctuary, he might just send all these migrants who are seeking asylum to the sanctuary cities in the United States. I think he thought that was a pretty smart joke. I actually welcomed the idea. Good idea. Yes, we'll take them. We certainly have the capacity to, to reach out and house and welcome these people who might very legitimately deserve asylum. And we can find the resources to care for them and help them with their cases. Just a thought. Okay. Um, time to wrap, right? Yeah. Time to wrap. Um, one quick question for me. Um, I know Chuck's work in, as a historian also at Berkeley, and well, one of the themes of this talk was also um, rebel lawyer, rebel citizens, and I wonder if you might just comment on the rebel citizens and the Fair Play Committee in Berkeley. People don't know. Yeah, there were another group of, or another center of, of opposition, I guess you could call it, to the to the incarceration process and to the executive order. It was a group called the Fair Play Committee that was organized primarily in Berkeley, although it had people in other places. And it included some pretty powerful people, like Robert Gordon Sproul, the, uh, the president of the university at that time. But they took a very different route. They, their route was to try to lobby within the kind of confines of the establishment. They would go back to Washington, and there were members of Roosevelt's cabinet who opposed the, the incarceration. So they would try to work with them. Uh, one, one of the uh, one of the people who was um, closely associated with any of these people was Chira Obata, the, the well-known artist and art professor in Cal, Japanese immigrant, who was sent to camps. And one of the one of the members of the Fair Play Committee arranged with Roosevelt's daughter, 
who was sympathetic to the Barrett Lincoln to have some of Obata's paintings sent to the White House. And these paintings of the camps were hung in the White House. Mm -hmm. and so this is a whole different way of, um, I guess, politically trying to support. But it's also true that there, they particularly identified with the JACL, with the leadership of the JACL. And they didn't have anything to do with the renunciation. And they didn't really take a stand at all on the issue of Tokyo Rose. So, you know, again, I guess you could call them the establishment uh, opponents. And you could call Collins the rebel. And Collins was willing to go all the way. Well, someone said that you were afraid constantly that if you did something to resist the camps, worse things would happen to you. But if you don't do something bad, and something bad is being done, worse things will come. Mm -hmm. Could I write that down? <laughs> write that down? Sure. You should all take notes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you both very much. Society, and I'm sure that um, Chuck will be happy to sign them. So if we can make our way to the gallery, I think there may be some snacks too. So please um, continue. Upstairs. Also, these t-shirts that um, it says stop repeating history. This is the t-shirt that was designed for our border protest. Um, there will be another protest and pilgrimage to Crystal City, Texas in November. And so we're trying to gather funds for that purpose. So. Thank you. Thank you for being here.